Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless deuteronomy 22 5 a woman shall not wear anything that pertains to a man nor shall a man put on a woman's garment for all who do so are an abomination to the lord your god hollywood elites hold drag isn't dangerous telethon to hit back against new wave of anti-grooming laws designed to protect young children my friends Yes. Ah. We love you, Queen. We love, love you, Queen. We're in the corner and we've got you. There's so many things that are hurting and really killing our kids. And we all know what I'm talking about right now. And it ain't no drag queen. I want to uh, ask everybody out there, please, please support all the great organizations that are out there helping all of this nonsense going away like it should. All of these incredibly stupid policies. Bye. 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 No more room for hate. Only love and love equals drag queen. Drag queen. God gives a dire warning to anyone who would cause a child to sin, as we read in Matthew 18, 6 and 7. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come. But woe to that man by whom the offense comes. Queen lead singer Adam Lambert says anti-grooming laws aimed at stopping drag shows from bringing light to the world. Drag is joy. It's a celebration of all the things that make queer people who we are. Drag is an amazing way to, to, to bring light to the world. These lawmakers are terrified of just how brightly we're shining. They're using children as an excuse take one more thing away from us. They're clearly threatened that we are living our truth, that we aren't apologizing for it anymore. Let's come together and protect our drag entertainers in our community. Drag queens are not the light to the world. Jesus is, as we read in John 8:12. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Almost everything in this world has been perverted. The truth is being turned into lies and lies into the truth. Nothing seems to make sense anymore, at least to a righteous person, those that believe in Jesus Christ. God has revealed his truth to us through his word, the Bible. Knowing absolute truth is only possible through a personal relationship with the one who claims to be the truth, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only way, the only truth, the only life, and the only path to God. The fact that absolute truth does exist points us to the truth that there is a sovereign God who created the heavens and the earth and who has revealed himself to mankind in order that we might know him personally through his son, Jesus Christ. That is the absolute truth. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. In the last days, the prophet Zechariah tells us Israel will be the focal point of world conflict and he gives a dire warning to the nations who would dare come against Jerusalem. Zechariah 12, 2 and 3 Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces. 
though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. This prophecy is unfolding right before our very eyes. Under high alert, Israeli citizens living near the Gaza border have been ordered to stay inside. And that's after a Palestinian Islamic Jihad, they fired rockets against the Jewish state. In response, Israel's military is conducting a second day of strikes against terror targets inside Gaza. The latest round of targets are Islamic Jihad's rocket launching sites. Concern is mounting that Gaza's main terror group, Hamas, might join the fight. Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem. Palestinian terror groups have launched more than 250 rockets into southern Israel and as far away as Tel Aviv. The attacks come after Israel struck Palestinian Islamic Jihad rocket launching sites earlier in the day to degrade the terror group's ability to fire rockets. On Tuesday night, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu warned terror groups within Gaza not to harm Israeli civilians. Israel's policy is clear. Those who seek to harm Israel will be harmed. Those who kill our citizens will pay a heavy price. And those who fire on our cities and civilians will be held responsible for their actions. It may take time, but Israel will ultimately reach these terrorists. No one should doubt Israel's resolve to defend its citizens. The strike killed the three leaders, but at least 12 others died in those strikes. As always, Israel tried to minimize civilian casualties, and the state of Israel regrets any harm caused to non-combatants. The difference between Israel and our enemies is that we make every effort to keep the enemy's civilian population out of harm's way, while our enemies make every effort to deliberately target our civilians. We mourn the loss of innocent lives. They celebrate the loss of innocent life. Israeli security expert told CBN News that the strikes restored a level of deterrence and that Iran is the power behind Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Iran is the main uh, director of the initiatives of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, PIJ. Uh, it's the funder. It's also the training element. I mean, at the end of the day, these terrorists need to know how to prepare a drone, how to arm a drone, how to prepare an, an IED, an explosive device. And Iranian experts are actually helping them uh, achieve these terroristic goals. Former IDF international spokeswoman Avital Leibovich says it's all part of Iran's main goal. The most important message I would tell the American audience is the Iranian presence. In three out of Israel's four borders, there is Iranian presence, and I don't mean it in a positive way. I mean Iran is trying to build some kind of a network of terror groups uh, by uh, delivering here arms, strategic weapons, different capabilities. They say it loud and clear. They don't want Israel to exist. The major question today is if Hamas, the major terror group in the Gaza Strip, will join the fight. That would indicate a major escalation and the potential for many more days of fighting. Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu said that he has instructed the IDF in particular and the security establishment at large to prepare for any scenario. We are at the height of an operation. In the next several days, we will all be required to exercise fortitude and resilience. When we took the decision to initiate Operation Shield and Arrow a week ago, the defense minister and I instructed the IDF and the security establishment to prepare for any scenario of escalation, and it may include more than one front. This evening, I tell our enemies, any escalation by your hands will be met with a decisive response by us. The Bible tells us there are four possible prophecies on the verge of finding fulfillment. Isaiah 17.1, in which Damascus, Syria will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Alam, which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program. Psalm 83, in which the Muslim nations that border Israel will mount an attack on Israel in order to cut them off from being a nation. Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. This morning, Russian President Vladimir Putin delivered a defiant message to the West on the war in Ukraine on a day marking the Allies' victory in World War II. Now, his speech came just hours after the Russian military fired a new barrage of missiles at Ukrainian cities. Charlie Daggett has more on that part of the story. It is an annual military flex across Red Square that it's taken on added significance since Russia launched its invasion of Ukraine, commemorating the anniversary of the defeat of Nazi Germany in 1945. But from Putin's perspective, it's now Russia that's under attack from the West. 
A real war has once again been unleashed against our motherland, he said. Surveying rows of young men who haven't yet been sent to the slaughter on the battlefields of Ukraine, the president's pleased expression belied the grim reality of his special military operation. And even rolling out the big guns, it was a smaller display than previous parades with a significant amount of Russia's firepower deployed elsewhere. Moscow's attempt to rain missiles down on Ukraine fell short, with the Ukrainian Air Force saying its defenses shot down 23 of 25 cruise missiles, the majority once again aimed at the capital itself. That followed a swarm of dozens of drones the night before, the largest drone attack since the war began, we're told. And it's the fifth time Russia has tried to attack the capital this month. Matthew 24, 6 and 7. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Nation is the Greek word ethnos, which means a race, as of the same habit, i.e. a tribe, especially a foreign, non-Jewish one, Gentiles, usually by implication, pagan. What I believe Jesus is saying here is that there have always been wars and rumors of wars. But when you see the same ethnic group fighting the same ethnic group, now pay attention. His return is near. Their belongings piled onto a donkey. These refugees have just arrived from Western Sudan. Many are from Tendelti, a small town located about 20 kilometers away. They say that their town was attacked by armed men. The army allegedly fled. Several houses were burned down. People were scared and decided to flee. The war in Khartoum created a climate of general insecurity. Nowhere is really safe. That's why we left. With the capital Khartoum, Western Sudan is one of the areas that's been worse hit since fighting broke out in mid-April between the Sudanese army and the paramilitary RSF group. According to the UN, almost 200 people have been killed in the state of West Darfur over the past two weeks. On Friday, the state governor accused the RSF group of damaging government offices and setting fires to shelters for displaced communities and looting homes and stores. Each day, hundreds if not thousands of people are trickling across the border into Chad. UNHCR is working to resettle people in a 50-kilometer radius, far enough to make sure people are safe and close enough to provide them with aid. Already, at least 150,000 people have fled the country. For a week now, ethnic violence has gripped the northeast Indian state of Manipur. Curfews imposed after the unrest have been relaxed in some areas, and authorities have urged people to give peace a chance. For years, tensions have been simmering between the Kuki tribes and Metis over the distribution of resources such as land. Protests over giving special status to the majority Metis proved to be the tipping point. Hospital officials say hundreds of people were injured in the violence and many are still recovering. Security forces remain on the streets and military officials say at least 23,000 people displaced by the fighting are being housed on army bases. Authorities say the situation is under control, but for many here, peace remains elusive. Luke 2125 and there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. One of the many signs we are living in the last days, right before the return of Jesus Christ, is nations will be in a state of perplexity, or uncertainty over what to do in a difficult situation. This is exactly what is happening in our world today. Turning overseas, Pakistan is bracing for a new round of violent protests following the arrest of former Prime Minister Imran Khan. His supporters clashed with police across the country yesterday. At least two people were killed and dozens were injured. Authorities say hundreds of Khan supporters have been arrested. NPS Tayyab reports on the turmoil. Pakistan is convulsing with political unrest. After dozens of security forces smashed their way into a local court and took former Prime Minister Imran Khan into custody. Seen here in a wheelchair, surrounded by shields and wearing a bulletproof helmet. 
Khan is accused in several corruption cases ranging from improper property deals to allegations he unlawfully sold state gifts, charges he denies and says are politically motivated. His supporters have reacted with fury, protesting in several cities. Pakistan's all-powerful military looms large over the nation's politics, having ruled the country for more than half of its existence and have given their backing to the current prime minister, Shabazz Sharif. But since Khan was ousted from power last year in what he says was an orchestrated plot, the nuclear-armed and strategic Washington ally has been spiraling into political chaos. Chaos which has seen the U.S. Embassy in Islamabad cancel all consular services. And the fear now is the country of 230 million people has been plunged into an abyss that may not be easy to come out of. Is global chaos the new normal? As anyone can plainly see, the world is in a state of decay, moral, economic, political, every way possible. People are saying the world is out of control and looking for someone, anyone, to rescue the planet. Soon, very soon, a leader will appear on the horizon that appears to have all the answers, to calm the oceans, to bring peace to all the nations. His title will be the Antichrist, and he will be welcomed by millions of those on earth not taken with the rapture. Unfortunately, his true identity will be known soon to those left behind that his true intentions are death, destruction, and control. So yes, global chaos is the new normal until the Lord Jesus Christ comes at the end of the Antichrist's seven-year reign of terror and establishes true peace on earth. It seems like a good time for Satan to present the lawless one to the world. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 through 12. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Political and spiritual forces are stoking the flames of division. The question is, how do we restore unity, not only in our nation, but also in our churches? Gary Lane recently talked to two bridge builders who shared some thoughts on finding the way back. Political disagreements over Donald Trump and Joe Biden and a potentially hostile election season are fracturing America. The country is polarized and deeply divided over politics and culture, and the divisions have even crept into the church. Spiritual warfare is off the charts. Battle lines are being drawn, and people are choosing sides. The United States is divided on just about every issue. Race, homosexuality, transgenderism, abortion, climate change, gun rights, and the list goes on. Jesus said that a kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, as we read in Matthew 12, 25. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself will not stand. Jesus tells us he is the reason behind the division we are seeing today as we read in Luke 12, 51 through 53. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. For from now on, five in one house will be divided, three against two and two against three. Father will be divided against son and son against father mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Christians uh, are, are sadly, in many ways, we're, we're reflecting the world and the fact that we're just as divided as, as everyone else. But you know, Jesus calls us to something better. He said that um, the world would know that we are his by the way we love each other. Doctrinal issues are dividing denominations. Southern Baptists are at odds over the role of women in the pulpit. And disagreement over homosexual leaders in the church has split the United Methodist Church.
Darling believes the Methodists are dealing with a cultural issue that's in conflict with biblical teachings and should not change church doctrine. 1 Timothy 4.16 Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things. For as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. When you talk about um, sexual ethics, you know, um, this is pretty clear in Scripture. It's something that Christians uh, can't yield on, that we have to be uh, resolute and stand for it with, with courage and with compassion, uh, with courage and civility. Pastor David Anderson is founder of Gracism Global, an organization committed to bridging divides in culture, faith, race, and wealth. He says leaders of both major political parties stoke anger and leverage division on issues like race and abortion when real solutions are needed. What we have to ask is how do you get to the bottom line of getting less abortions? How do you get to the bottom line of saying this is what God's ideal is, but this is the real that we live in? And what is the role of the church? Darling urges Christians to stand for truth and show love for their neighbor especially when they disagree. So, Dan, how do we disagree well? Well, I think we disagree well by saying, you know, when it's among Christians, to say, look, this brother or sister, I disagree with on this. Here's why. But I, I love them, uh, not back down on what we believe. But also we can treat our neighbors uh, and see them as God sees them, as people made in the image of God and uh, people for whom Jesus died. Anderson contends America needs leaders who can bridge the real and the ideal. What we need are bridge builders and we need healers to say, listen, I understand both sides, but how can we go forward instead of left, instead of right? How do we go higher? And I think that's what we're called to as believers. The evil we are seeing today isn't Republican versus Democrat, right versus left. It's good versus evil. There are only two groups of people in this world, the saved and the unsaved. Here's a question everyone needs to answer. Whether you are a Democrat, Republican, or not affiliated with either party, do you love Jesus? Many professing Christians say they love Jesus, but in all actuality, they hate him. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Many who profess to be Christ followers are pro-abortion, pro-homosexual, and pro-transgender. They are defiant to the laws of God as we read in 1 John 3, 4, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. How then can these people claim they love Jesus when he said, if you love me, keep my commandments? Jesus declares, they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. As we read in Matthew 15, 8 and 9, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For those who say Jesus never said anything about abortion, homosexuality, and transgenderism being a sin, the Bible tells us all scripture is inspired by God as we read in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Scripture has plenty of negative things to say about killing the innocent and homosexuality. It's called lawlessness. Many professing Christians justify sin by using Christ's commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. Loving your neighbor as yourself means telling them the truth in love, not by condoning their sin. The good news is, God will forgive all sin, as we read in 1 John 1.9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Matthew 7.21-23 Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. At that time, 
those who practice lawlessness will be cast into the blazing furnace, as we read in Matthew 13, 41, and 42. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Those who are covered by the righteousness of Christ will shine like the sun, as we read in Matthew 13, 43. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. The signs of Jesus soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him, and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance, but it is one of the results of genuine faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.